<laughs> okay, so yeah, great pleasure to have Sandeep Tuvedi telling us about uh, JT gravity, random matrices, and uh, for the mathematician, uh, the connection to Mirza Khani uh, recursive relation. So, Sandeep, all yours. Okay. Thanks, for, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mahan, and uh, thanks a lot, Anish, for this invitation. I'm really very happy to be here to tell you about. Uh, a model of two-dimensional gravity called Jekyll Teitelboim gravity and its connections with random matrices and so on. I should say at the outset, I'm quite apprehensive to be giving this talk because, you know, I know now through long experience over many yep. years that it's not easy to communicate across the corridor here in TIFR, but <laughs> I'll uh, still uh, give it my best shot. And I apologize in advance because I'm sure some of those limitations are not just because I lack that precision in language, but probably also in thought to really give you satisfactory answers. But I was still keen to tell you about some of these developments because despite my limitations, I think they're very interesting. And I also feel that they are closely connected to the, the, the kind of um, sort of idea some of you had when you started this random surfaces initiative in that it brings together topics in mathematics and string theory and statistical mechanics very nicely and i think the subject has a, a lot of richness to it so i think we are uh, we've already seen some very exciting developments but i think in the year in the couple of years to come there will be there will continue to be some very exciting developments so and I certainly hope I can learn from all of you about many things which will help me in my own work. Okay, so, so thanks a lot. And please feel free to interrupt, uh, and especially all the experts who are here, uh, please do correct me and, and join in any time you like. This doesn't have to be a very formal talk or anything. <clears throat> I hope that's okay with the organizers too. So I have a, a, a talk which is you know, not very technical and uh, which is sort of a general talk. Um, and I have mostly mathematicians in mind, but I wasn't sure. So I also have a few slides for people from statistical mechanics, et cetera, but I'm not sure there are people from that community here. So we can see when we come to those slides, sorry. Um, so I'll start with a uh, introduction, just remind you all about how we formulate mechanics, uh, first classical mechanics, and then quantum mechanics uh, in physics. And the quantum mechanics formulation we will use when we go to uh, our theory of gravity is uh, what is called the path integral formulation of quantum mechanics. Now I also know through experience that uh, the moment one comes to path integrals, you know, uh, mathematicians get extremely queasy and uh, their eyes begin to glaze over. And uh, for good reason, because, um, you know, the path integral is not formulated with the kind of precision that would make mathematicians comfortable, especially when we uh, go beyond point particle quantum mechanics to quantum field theory, and especially to gravity, which is the subject of today's talk. Still in physics, we in some situations understand the path integral well enough. And that is the formulation which is best suited in many ways for discussing some aspects of gravity. So I'll introduce that when I talk about mechanics in general. Then we'll turn to Jekyll Teitelboim gravity. I'll shorten it to JT for the rest of the talk. I'll introduce um, what the action is for this theory and discuss some of the um, aspects of its classical behavior. We'll then turn to quantizing this theory and we'll do it in two ways. Again, I'll only sketch out a few facets. I won't get into the technicalities. Uh, I'll discuss what's called the second order formalism, uh, which is the one that we have been uh, trying to understand and develop with my students, Sunil Sake and uh, Upamanyu Moitra. Um, I think Upmanyu is here, hopefully Sunil also. So feel free to also join in, both of you. And then I'll discuss the first order formalism. Uh, actually, the first order formalism was, uh, was developed first for this problem and, and really uh, impressively carried through. 
And um, really the all genus answer, et cetera, which we'll then talk about has been obtained in this formalism. So mostly the results I will discuss come from the first order formalism. The results will be connected to the volume of moduli spaces of bordered Riemann surfaces. As I indicated in my abstract, this is a subject uh, many of you I'm sure know uh, well, certainly know a lot more about than I do. And um, those results will allow us then to connect the path integral in this theory of gravity to a particular kind of random matrix model. Basically, the results in the path integral which will involve these volumes will lend themselves to a recursion relation, which is tied to the recursion relation that Mirza Khani developed in studying the volumes of these Riemann surfaces. And the same recursion relations very beautifully arise uh, from random matrix theory. This agreement between the two will have quite interesting implications for what is this theory of gravity that we are studying. And it's a unconventional explanation, not one which we have uh, seen earlier in physics. Um, and we will end by discussing uh, what we are learning and what it means perhaps for our study of gravity more generally. So, so that's the plan of the talk. And as I said, please feel free to, to interrupt me. Uh, there are three key papers, although I won't get into anywhere near the kind of detail these papers have. Paper by Stanford and Witten, which really, in a sense, um, I would say uh, presages many of the developments which then happened. Important paper of Saad, Schenker, and Stanford, where they developed the first order formalism, sorry. And then the paper I mentioned with my students, um, where we worked in what's called the second order formalism. Uh, which we hope to develop further as we go forward. Okay, so um, two-dimensional gravity is a rich subject. It's a much simpler than uh, four-dimensional gravity, as we call it in physics, four because three space and one time. Uh, that's the world around us. Um, four-dimensional gravity is very complicated, especially when we come to its quantum behavior very poorly understood, uh, but two-dimensional gravity is much simpler, yet rich enough to possess um, many of the uh, key features of the higher dimensional analogs. And this is what makes it so interesting. We hope to really make very concrete progress in this problem and hopefully learn about the physically more interesting, more complicated cases. As, as will come out and is actually already known, um, to physicists, uh, the subject is also connected to the study of random surfaces. This was a connection which was actually, I'm very uh, proud to say, developed here in TIFR in very good part uh, by the work of Spenta Vadia and uh, uh, Gautam Mandal, Shumit Das, Avinash Dhar, et cetera, and many other people in the 80s. <laughs> Um, and uh, the current resurgence of interest in two-dimensional gravity, JT gravity, et cetera, also builds on those connections and I think take them further in interesting directions as we'll see. Also connected to statistical mechanics, random matrices, et cetera, as I mentioned. And of course, um, <clears throat> as I also mentioned, no. the results uh, tie in with the study of Riemann surfaces in mathematics. So it's a very interesting, rich subject. The subject of JD gravity is old from the 80s, but there's a recent resurgence of interest. From the physics point of view, this is another very interesting connection, which I'll not uh, be able to do justice to, which has to do with condensed matter physicists getting interested in gravity um, and uh, then trying to model various black holes um, through spin systems and, and spin glasses. Uh, which led them to various models that then resulted in a resurgence of interest. Um, so the beginnings of this more recent interest in the subject also connect back to the study of statistical mechanics. But that's only in passing here. Okay, so it's an old subject, but now drawing attention. I'm going to now shift gears and just remind you a little bit about classical mechanics. Uh, the, uh, the first time we learn about it is through Newton's laws, but a slightly more sophisticated formulation, which is uh, useful, um, 
when we go to the quantum theory, especially, uh, comes in terms of the Lagrangian formulation. And uh, this is tied to what is called the principle of least action. <laughs> and if you're doing, say, a point particle, we think of the trajectory it follows in space as a function of time. It starts at some initial condition xi at time ti and reaches the position xf at time tf. And um, one way to derive Newton's laws is to be able to write down an action. And that action is extremized, uh, subject to the condition that the point particle starts at xi at ti and lands up at xf at time tf. And this extremization of the action then gives rise to Newton's uh, laws or, or his equations of motion. So that's one way to think about classical mechanics. Um, sometimes it's called least action. More correctly, it arises by extremizing the action. This action can be written in terms of what's called the Lagrangian. The Lagrangian is a function of the position of the particle and its velocity, x dot. And um, out of that, you build the Lagrangian, you integrate it. Sorry, there shouldn't be two dt's here, just once. You integrate this Lagrangian from the initial time to the final. And this is what you have to extremize to get uh, Newton's equations. Okay, so this is the Lagrangian formulation. I'm sure you've all uh, seen it. And uh, that's a very, very uh, useful way to formulate uh, mechanics in physics. Now there's an alternative formulation, also uh, useful if we go to quantum mechanics, which is called the Hamiltonian uh, framework. Here, instead of uh, dealing with the position and the velocity, we deal with the position and the momentum. You can solve for the velocity in terms of the uh, momentum and position. Um, and sorry, and, uh, oh, oh, what happened? And, um, and, and then there is something called the Hamiltonian, which depends on the position and momentum. And uh, you can solve for, for and you, you start, I'm sorry, this should have been X, I made it Q, uh, X and P. You start with X and P at a given instant of time. And um, um, the, Hamil the, the Hamiltonian and, and so on give you how uh, the, uh, the, the position evolves, its time derivative, as well as how the momentum evolves. This commutator here actually stands for a Poisson bracket. There's a symplectic structure in phase space made out of X and P and so on. Uh, we don't have to go into all that. Just to say that there is in this other formulation, you work with position and momentum and a Hamiltonian and that Hamiltonian then gives you the evolution of the system. We won't use the Hamiltonian framework very much directly for gravity, but when we come to trying to understand it and what it's teaching us about the underlying theory of gravity, we'll come back to the Hamiltonian. And we'll also use the Hamiltonian to try and connect with random matrix theory. Okay, so that's a very fast kind of introduction to mechanics. Um, I'm now going to go to uh, this theory of gravity, but let me pause for a minute to ask if, if there are any questions or comments from anyone at this stage. Um, anything from any one of you? Um, okay. Um, well, uh, feel free to, to uh, interrupt me as I go along as well. Um, so um, let me now, oh yes, yeah, sorry, I have to still pass to quantum mechanics. I haven't done that. That was just classical mechanics. So now how do we formulate quantum mechanics? Um, uh, let's do it in this Lagrangian formulation. Um, you know, as I said, in that formulation, you think in terms of, in classical mechanics, a particular trajectory. You go from Xi to Xf along a particular trajectory obtained by extremizing the action. In quantum mechanics instead, as formulated by Feynman, uh, you have to sum over all trajectories. And actually they don't even have to be smooth. I've, the fact that they're a little kinky here is more due to my poor artwork, but in fact, they can be very kinky. You have to sum over all, all paths, all trajectories. And uh, you weight each trajectory 
by a weighting factor, which I've shown here as e to the i s over h bar. This s is the same action we saw earlier in classical mechanics. Uh, so it's obtained from the Lagrangian by doing an integral, except you're not working with one trajectory which extremizes the action, but rather you allow uh, yourself all possible trajectories um, and just weight them by this weighting factor. Now this constant h bar is a very important constant which arises when you go to quantum mechanics, it's called Planck's constant. And for everyday situations like a cricket ball making its way uh, in the Chepok Stadium today, um, the action is much bigger than h bar. So to good approximation, you can evaluate this integral using a saddle point approximation. Uh, because the phase oscillates very rapidly as you move away from the saddle point. And that means you can work with one trajectory which extremizes the action. Okay. And that's. I mean, there's a question in the chat. Oh, yeah. Go, go ahead. Sorry, I should be able to read the chat one second. Yeah. So, what is D in the integral from ah, BB now? Yeah. Right, right. No, key question. Um, D is, is all important. And I'm going to say a little bit more about it. And it's the key here. And it's due to D being not as precise as you would like that mathematicians get uncomfortable with the path integral. I'm coming to it in a moment. Thanks, thanks a lot. So um, I, I'll try to try to say a little more. So um, I hope, okay, we'll see. I'm not sure I have any slides, but yeah. So uh, anyway, the basic idea is that you can get away with a saddle point in some situations and that's when the classical approximation is good, but more generally you have to sum over all trajectories. Now, um, as was said, what is the measure with which we sum over all paths? And this is very important. And the, the set of paths or configurations is an infinite dimensional space. So this measure is not easy to define, but it has to be defined carefully to be able to make sense of the path integral. Now let's see how I do. I don't even have some slides. I got rid of them thinking I'll be out of time, but let me say a few words. Um, this measure is now reasonably well understood for the, I would say quite well understood by physics standards, very well understood uh, for a problem involving say a point particle. And the basic idea is as follows. You think in terms of a set of functions, a complete set of functions, Okay, um, which, um, uh, which are a function of time, take values xi at ti and xf at tf. This complete set of functions could be some complete set of, uh, in terms of which you can expand uh, the eigen, uh, a complete set uh, of, of eigen modes for some uh, self adjoint operator you can define. Um, and uh, and uh, so you expand the particular uh, uh, function x of t in terms of this complete set. Um, and uh, then uh, you define the measure in terms of the expansion coefficients that appear, okay? Uh, you have to define that measure carefully still because it's an infinite dimensional integral. And typically the way you do it as a physicist is um, that you, you may, you sort of give a slightly imprecise definition by truncating the complete, instead of the infinite dimensional complete set to some finite set. Uh, you then do the integral and you obtain a determinant. Uh, that determinant, if you have truncated to say um, uh, n uh, eigenmodes is a n by n matrix, roughly speaking. And then you take a n going to infinity limit by regulating that determinant suitably to get uh, a finite answer. So there's a little bit of, uh, if you like, uh, mumbo jumbo, but in the end, uh, there's a definition most physicists would be happy with, which for mathematicians, we can translate to a statement about a determinant, which is then made sense of through something like zeta function regularization. Okay, so that's the basic idea of how we make sense of this path integral. Um, is that okay? Or do you want me to give you a little more detail for a specific case? Uh, let me ask, sorry. Yes, that please. Was very impressionistic, I know, but uh, go, go ahead. Yes, please, yes, please. 
more, some okay. more details some more details yes 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 okay please. okay okay let me switch to my ipad okay um okay one sec uh, i'm going to get out or share screen here and bear with me for one sec because i will um, i will i will share so sandeep uh, one more uh, question on the slide uh, on the chat from ragunathan yeah Namely, is it a, is it a finite measure well let me tell you what i have in mind and and then you can see what uh, what you mean I, I, the way i think about it is that you make you you work by making it finite but then you have to take a kind of limit and uh, and uh, and then you know uh, ultimately you're dealing with uh, a, a, a space which is infinite dimensional uh, let me see if you can see my screen yeah okay so i will go to a notebook i'll try to write here okay so uh, uh, sandeep, sandeep uh, before yeah. you begin a quick question from the physics scientist yes. kedar i yes. was wondering if you are uh, there's some reason where in your particular applications you want to actually talk of the determinant instead of ratio of determinants like we usually do for correlation functions isn't that easier that's a, usually how we are told to think about it or that's not correct uh right you can kedar think in terms of ratios of determinants but actually uh, what i'll be talking about is a, a partition function so you um, actually need the whole you need the determinant not you're not satisfied with the ratio of determinants kind of thing okay i see but, but no no but but what i'll be mostly interested in is something like the temperature dependence of the partition function you know so i won't be interested in the exact normalization but let me say that uh, in this case in the first order formulation the uh, path integral has been done precisely enough that the normalization for um, various genuses can be correlated with each other so that there's only an uncertainty of an overall constant which can be absorbed into a term in the lagrangian so in fact um, i think in fact the the path integral even with the overall um, even the partition function can be obtained quite precisely um i say okay thanks thanks so that's much more precise hello hello i said uh, yeah go ahead i said that's much more precise than what we are usually used to right Or am that, I wrong? That, that, that's much more precise than what we are usually used to. I agree, um, but we are used to at least getting the temperature dependence right, and so on, right, in the partition function. But yes, yes, if yes. you like, by taking a derivative with respect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. But here we can do actually a little better because the theory is much simpler in the end than anything you deal with, Kedar, as will come out uh, in the talk. okay uh oh what happened i guess i got bumped off of my screen share just just give me one more minute let me get that screen share activated again um sorry about this it will just take me one more minute and then let me try and see how well i do for this um uh, sandeep there's one more question while you're fixing this stuff up from yes, sudeep goswami for the two dimensional liouville quantum gravity is the understanding of the measure considered to be better there are several works by probabilists in recent years on this problem ah he, okay now um hmm okay maybe others can say this uh, better than me i uh, the the uh, i think there's a lot more work in liouville gravity that is correct um now the, the my understanding is that if you literally try to quantize it the um uh, the way i will try to describe quantizing two dimensional metrics the understanding is roughly comparable to what we have today namely you have to do a functional integral and ultimately you have to make sense of infinite dimensional determinants by regulating them um but the the final answers can be uh, related quite precisely to quantities in random matrices and so on uh, which can be formulated uh, at finite uh, rank and so on uh, so that uh, you know the intermediate steps um, have 
perhaps by mathematician standards, some considerable degree of imprecision, but the final answers we have good reason to believe are sensible. This is how I would summarize it. I haven't kept up with the latest in, uh, in 2D Liouville gravity, uh, although it's closely connected to what I'm going to say. Uh, so if someone else wants to correct me, I, I would be happy to, to stand corrected. But I think it's a reasonable summary. The direct path integral is, is, uh, is, not, is not precise. Uh, has the, roughly the same level of imprecision as the second order formalism I'll describe today. Um, but there, there could be variants which do better. Um, okay, let me, let me at least take a stab at trying to make sense of the path integral for, for a, a point particle problem. Um, so this is uh, what we call point particle. I call it point particle because after this we'll go to fields and so on that gets much more complicated. The canonical example here that we deal with in physics is called a harmonic oscillator. So I'll describe that problem to you. And here you have a particle which is in one dimension. So X is a function of T. The Lagrangian is half. Okay, I'm going to suppress some parameters like the mass and so on just to keep it um, simple. So uh, the, this is the Lagrangian, x is a function of t, x dot is the derivative with respect to t, omega is some parameter which enters um, in, in, the, in describing the system. And now we have to do this path integral. Um, e to the i um, l dt. And there's an h bar here which let me put, although I'll maybe set it to zero, it's, uh, one, sorry, not zero, one um, at some point. Okay, so this is the problem. Now um, we are going to do the following things, okay? Some of which we will do um, uh, in, in our talk just to try and make it a little better. First of all, instead of working with a phase and so on, um, I'm going to, uh, and this Lagrangian, I'm going to work with the following problem. I'm going to work with a um, measure. Okay, uh, let, let me do it in steps. Uh, by doing a, a integral by parts on the x dot term, I'm going to write this as x times minus d square over dt square plus omega square x uh, dt. So that I've written it in terms of an operator. Um, I'm a, so think of this as an, as an operator acting on, on X of T. Uh, this operator, if I think of uh, functions which meet the condition that, what I call Dirichlet conditions, that this is Xi and X of Tf is Xf, then this operator you can show is uh, self-adjoint with respect to a standard inner product, which I can define which is if I have two functions of meeting these conditions, x1 of t and x2 of t, then the inner product between them, I don't know if this notation is okay with you all, is x1 of t, x2 of t. Okay, so there's an inner product. You can show that the operator I defined is self-adjoint with respect to that inner product and so on. Is this making sense or am I speaking too imprecisely for you all? Sorry. So uh, there, there is one question. Okay. Uh, so let's see. So why is x square coming in L? Uh, this is from, from Professor B. V. Rao. I understand x dot square is kinetic energy. I thought you should have potential energy next, namely only x, not x square. Oh, not x square. Acha, acha. Um, so this is because I chose a, uh, so a particular kind of system. You could have had X, but uh, uh, you know, that's, uh, then we have to uh, deal with it. This is a sort of simpler system. And roughly, if you want to know when does a system like this arise physically, if you take a pendulum and you study its small oscillations under the Earth's gravitational field, you displace it there's a restoring force so that it tries to come back, then that uh, 
that pendulum is described by this kind of an uh, Lagrangian, where x is the is the angle describing the small displacement of the pendulum. Okay, so uh, instead of something just bobbing up and down, uh, if you have a pendulum going around in in the Earth's gravitational field, then you'll get this kind of a system that I was talking about. It's a little bit easier and uh, uh, to to describe uh, sort of the uh, the properties of the operator in this case. That's why I thought I would uh, I would use this example. Um, yeah. Well, one more question: What is the limit of the integral in the definition of the inner product? As uh, presumably sorry. as h cross. Sorry. Sorry. As h cross sorry. tends to zero. T one to T two. Uh, T one uh, T i to T f. The initial to final times. Uh, does that make sense? Maybe I didn't say it very nicely. Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah. So the same two times over which your trajectories go, did I even draw them? I didn't even draw them. Yeah, I'll draw them. So you're going from xi at time ti to xf at time tf. So these two times are the two limits which come in this integral. Is that okay? Absolutely fine. Okay, okay. So you have this operator and it's self-adjoint, and what you can then do is um, uh, consider various eigenmodes of this operator. So let me label them by some integer, uh, by by some number n. Uh, in this case, they are integer, and um, and so you can say I'm going to study this kind of a problem, and these are eigenvectors. And these are eigenmodes. Oh, eigenvalues, sorry. Okay, so you um, you can you can find all the eigenvalues and eigenvectors and so on. And then you can say, well, you know, uh, since it's self-adjoint and so on, I can expand a general function in terms of the. Um, oh, I'm sorry. This is physics notation. Um, let me get rid of physics notation. And then you say, okay, I'm going to expand this in a complete set like this. Here in the simple problem, it's a it's a discrete sum, so that's uh, one of the reasons it's a easier problem. So you expand it out like this. Mm. And now we come to what do you make? Uh, how do you define the measure? And you say, well, I'm going to define it like this. Okay, this is my definition. Now, of course, this is not well defined because this sum actually goes is, is infinite. And so this is a infinite dimensional integral. That's what I meant by saying that it's not precise. But um, okay, let me, as a physicist, I'm going to say, well, suppose I was to truncate it at some capital N, let me try and see what I'll get for the path integral. So I get, um, times um, x o hat of t x dt, there's some h bar that I have to do. And now I'm going to write this as product over n dcn. So I get e to the i over h bar. Um, the various, let's, the, all the eigenvalues it turns out are distinct. Eigenvectors are therefore orthogonal. I can choose them to be orthonormal um, and so on. So and in the end, um, um, in the end, I get something like lambda n because this acts here, uh, cn square. From each of these, there's some integral over the modes. I chose them to be orthonormal. So I, I got rid of that integral and I get some, some integral like this to do. Sorry for being messy. But um, is that so basically? Yeah, that's that, that, that's basically some infinite dimensional Gaussian that you're looking at. Exactly, exactly. So it's an infinite dimensional Gaussian, and now you know, as I said, being a physicist, you say, "Oh, let me see what I get if I were to take it up to n," and you'll get something like you know, 
one over square root of lambda n up to factors product over n. And this is the determinant I was telling you about. This is basically determinant. Uh, this is, uh, you know, the product of eigenvalues, therefore the determinant of O hat t raised to the power half, you know. But of course, it's um, n should now be taken to infinity. So, so now you have to take n to infinity. That requires you to make sense of this determinant. So this is roughly one upon, I've dropped factors of i and so on h bar, but I'm just trying to give you an idea. This is something like this. So now you have to try and make sense of this. And now you say, okay, I will try to do some kind of a regularization. And quite often the, the most sensible thing to do is zeta function regularization. And I think that's something you know well. It's a kind of way to analytically continue is the way I understand it. Uh, and, and so you, you regulate in some way. And finally, you get a number out of this. That number in this problem ends up depending on uh, the parameter omega and on h bar, this Planck's constant. I'd said that some, somewhere I stopped uh, writing down the h bars. Um, the operator cares about omega, so you get a number like that. It also depends on the initial position and the final position, xi and xi. So uh, you get, after that kind of regularization, some answer which depends on these, and that gives you the quantum sort of result for summing over all traffic. Okay, let me pause here. Did this sort of make sense? Or... Absolutely, yeah. Wow. Okay. Okay. If, if, if somebody has any other questions, yeah, they could. Okay. Okay. Should Great. I go ahead, um, ma'am? Yes, please. Okay. So now let me get rid of this and uh, I'll just stop my screen share here and go back here. Okay. Mm. So here we are. Um, no, thank you for that. Um, so uh, now, uh, so, well, uh, this is how we try and make sense of this kind of path integral. Uh, now we will be in more complicated situations. I'll, I'll mention a little bit. Uh, and therefore we will, um, you know, have to work much harder in trying to make sense of the path integral. And really the whole talk the whole talk is about trying to make sense of the measure we will get when we come to a sum over geometries. As you'll see, the problem in gravity will become a sum over geometries. There'll be one more degree of freedom, but really it's the sum over various geometries, metrics that we will have to work very hard to try and make sense of. This problem is impossible in three plus one dimension. In the case of physical, real physical interest, and it's widely believed that you need to greatly extend the theory, maybe go to string theory, add many degrees of freedom and so on. Very poorly in, understood. In the very simple two-dimensional context, also it's not well understood, much, much less well understood than this point particle problem I described. But we will, you know, with some slate of hand and so on, uh, try to make sense of it. And ultimately, the, the best reason to think that what we have done is not complete garbage is that we will connect with interesting mathematics and so on. So um, if you like, there will be uh, some amount of you know, um, dirty physics, uh, but in the end, some nice mathematics that will come out. OK, but that's really what the rest of the talk is. OK, but let me go slowly towards this two-dimensional theory of gravity. Okay, now I described to you an action for that point particle theory. Now I'm going to describe for you the action uh, for this two dimensional theory of gravity. Now, the first thing there is that instead of dealing with functions of time, we are going to deal with fields uh, in, in two dimensional space time. So we have one space direction and one time direction um, and and phi, which is a scalar field, depends on both of these directions. And the metric is also then a field depending on the coordinates in space-time. Okay, that's how at least a physicist would think about it. 
Um, um, so, so R is, uh, what is, what is R? I mean, is it? Yes, yes, yes. I'm, I'm coming to that. Exactly, exactly. R here is the Riemann curvature. So uh, we will uh, have a metric and out of that we can construct the Riemann curvature and R is, is that Riemann curvature of this two dimensional uh, space. Um, a phi, as I said, is a, is a scalar, is, is a, some scalar field. Um, two is just a constant in some units, um, which sets the scale for geometry, if you like. Um, this is an integral over all of space time. Uh, there is a boundary term which is needed. Um, this is needed so that um, if you were to vary this action, uh, you get a well-defined set of equations, uh, a well-defined uh, set of equations of, of motion, uh, the analog of Newton's laws in point particle mechanics. Uh, remember in the point particle mechanics problem, when we varied the action, we varied it subject to the condition that the particle was at the initial position at time ti and the final position at time tf. Now here we have to try and similarly specify the behavior of the geometry um, in, in some boundary region. And I will come to that in more detail, it's important. But at the end of the day, we need some boundary terms to make sense of, of the uh, principle of least action in this problem. So that's why these boundary terms are added, um, keeping in mind the possibility of a boundary, which we will have. Um, um, so, but, but, but G is, isn't G a tensor? I mean, it's, G is a two cross two matrix, right? Ah, I mean, okay. G is a two cross two matrix. Are there some matrix. Yes, are yes. Some... Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, you take, um, now I'll just try to annotate here. Let me see if I can get away. Otherwise I'll go to my iPad. You can just say it. It's okay. Uh, I mean... It's R, R mu nu, lower mu nu contracted with the metric. G upper mu nu. So you okay, contract the two indices with the metric. Is that okay? Yes, thanks. Okay, sorry, I should have said it. It is not the Rima, it's the Ricci scalar. I, I used the wrong word. Yeah, yeah, okay, thank The you, Ricci thanks. scalar. Please excuse me. Made out of the Riemann. Sorry for that imprecision. Okay, uh, now I lost my mouse. Okay, just give me a second. Hmm. <laughs> okay, just bear with me. What has happened to my mouse? It is frozen. Ah, it has now appeared. Here we go. Okay. okay, sorry, please bear with me. Will it change slides? No. Hmm. Sorry about that. I have a bit of an issue. My screen has frozen. Okay. <laughs> Let me describe the other characters here. Maybe the screen will start behaving. Um, K, which appears on the boundary, is the extrinsic curvature. Again, it's the actually the uh, the extrinsic curvature is in fact one dimensional in this problem. Sandeep, uh, uh, Sandeep, are you going to stick with uh, this signature, or are you going to at some point uh, become take make Euclidean? I'm going to very soon make it Euclidean, Ramdas. Okay, very because soon. Otherwise, otherwise, you'll have all kinds of problems, right? Including the fact that that your typical Genus G surface with the boundary may not have uh, Lorenzian metric uh, on it, etc., etc. Absolutely correct, Ramdas. Absolutely correct. And I'm very, very soon going to tuck tail and go into Euclidean space. Uh, the only reason I started with Lorenzian yeah. is I want to at least describe for you the classical solutions in this theory. It's simple enough that all classical solutions in the Lorenzian case can be written down. And okay. I just wanted to say in words what they are without going into detail because they are rich enough to be interesting. Uh, okay. And then uh, having said that, I'll go quickly into uh, Euclidean signature. That's uh, one, one, one more question. Uh, the metric on the bound, are you going to demand that the boundaries be totally geodesic or something like that? Or, I mean, how does the... Uh, yeah, huh? yeah. Uh, again, great question. The natural thing to have done is to take geodesic boundaries. Absolutely okay. right. In fact, let me say it here. Unfortunately, everything is frozen, but 
you know, the, the scalar phi appears very simply as just a Lagrange multiplier, you know, okay. multiplying okay. r plus 2. So uh, when I ultimately try to make sense of my uh, path integral, when I sum over all values of phi, it will actually impose a delta function condition, um, which will localize my uh, integral onto manifolds of uh, meeting the condition that the that the Ricci scalar equals minus two. Okay. So okay. Minus okay, two okay, okay. 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 So okay, thanks. So, yeah. Yeah. And so now, just to complete, we'll have uh, hyperbolic spaces, and the natural boundaries to consider will be geodesics. Anyway, in general, they are geodesics, but here it's well studied. But we will not consider geodesic boundaries um, of, because, from a physics point of view, um, and this will connect a little bit to some of the other things. The boundaries are not geodesics, the natural ones are a little different to consider. But the final answer we will be able to express in terms of a result on geodesic boundaries. So, okay, thank you. So yeah, that, that's what we'll do. Okay, yeah. now uh, just bear with me because um, the only answer I see to this problem I'm now facing is <laughs> to try and reboot, which I am not keen to do. Uh, I can stop sharing and then start again sharing. I, I know, I know, but uh, the stop sharing is okay maybe let me let me see let me see let me see let me see no the stop sharing is it can does one of the organizers have privileges where you can stop my sharing because it doesn't let me um, okay let me try your screen sharing is paused it says so i can't um, oh no i don't think i i, I can can't do it either. yeah i i can't do it through, yeah i can't get into your thing and okay, okay. bear with me <coughs> i'm sorry unless some of the some of the younger people are i mean i am certainly much less tech savvy than no, no, any of no. the younger people here so. um this doesn't normally happen so Andeep, if you press escape maybe that ah helps. escape Thank you, thank you. Okay, that also didn't quite do it. Okay, sorry about this, I apologize. Mm, if you give me a minute, should I try to reboot it? What do you think? <laughs> sorry, <laughs> because I cannot- I think, sure, sure. sure. Logging ahead. out yeah. of Zoom and then coming in again might help. I mean, that's the old technique. Let me log out. Uh, if it yeah, logging out of Zoom and then coming in again. Shut down, restart. Do you mind if I if I just do that because yeah, I yeah, can't yeah, please, log please. out go ahead, otherwise? Go ahead. If you'll permit, please don't mind. Mahan, is no, it go okay? Ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, absolutely. I have go no ahead. other yeah. way of doing this. Okay. Yeah, yeah, go, go, ahead. Ahead. go ahead. Thank you. Uh -oh. Let's see. It'll just uh, in two minutes. It'll get back. So may I in between ask a question which was related to what uh, Kedar was pointing out? Oh, okay, it, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm just uh, waiting for it to get going, but uh, I'm on this device meanwhile, and I'm, uh, let me get my talk here so that I can hopefully play it for you on this device. Uh, go, go ahead, if someone has something to say. Yeah, to the word. Uh, uh, so uh, it was questions that related to the defining the measure. So in probability theory, when we have this different stochastic path, one yeah. concept that people use is called Rodon-Nicodin derivative, which is defines a relative measure of different paths. So you define your probability of some process with respect uh -huh. to well-defined probability of some another process. Does that yes. give any way well-definedness of this measure D? In uh, I will have to study that definition. Uh, so, uh, no, Radonicodim derivative is essentially if you have, I, mean, uh, the, I think the crucial place is, so that's a fairly classical thing. Essentially, I mean, you'll have two measures which have to be in the same, what is called measure class. 
and I suspect that the problems that will arise is that uh, the measures that you want will not be in the same measure class. So, for example, Brownian motion yes. and the space of path, it's not going to be in the same measure class as, say, I mean, as something derived from Lebesgue measure. I see. Right. So, so one is fractal and the dimension, the house of dimension will be different. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm almost, I'm almost there, so that uh, almost join you guys. They're just, they're just waiting for this minute. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm almost up there. Sorry about this. I'm almost up there. So, Sridhi, you did you say that uh, this is a change of measure, and then there is a base measure with respect to which you're integrating? So, With this, a, so uh, but uh, as Mahan said that they may not have the same kind of space. space, space, space. So they may not be may not be absolutely continuous with each other. Yes, exactly. So, exactly. exactly. Problem, yeah. okay. and, and here I think the crucial problem is this. I mean, see, is everything is defined on. I mean, if, if you truncated the the set of coefficients to n, then you get a regular regular Euclidean uh, measure on R capital N, but the, the crucial thing basically is how you take the limit as N tends to infinity, right? And that's where all this regularization is, is coming in, where the analytic continuation that uh, Sandeep was talking about comes in, I guess, I guess, in that sort of. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Ajay, yeah. can, you, can you folks see my screen? Um, yeah, yeah, uh, it says, uh, it says Sandeep Trivedi TIFR. And JT gravity, etc. Okay, yeah. excellent. Okay, so now this time around, let's hope that we make a little, we have a little better luck. Okay, so um, so um, let me um, get keep going. Uh, so uh, so this is the action. I hope it sort of at least makes sense. I'll have a little more to say about it. The last term here is kind of interesting. It um, s naught is just some constant. But Kai measures the, uh, the, the topology, the Euler character of this uh, space. Uh, again, um, it will be on, on good footing in a moment when I change signature, instead of working with uh, signature minus one, one, I go to uh, signature two, uh, comma zero. That is to say, uh, both positive signatures for, for my metric. Uh, and then chi will just be the standard Euler character uh, of the two-dimensional manifold I'm dealing with. So there's a loop, basically a topology counting parameter. I've just put it in because uh, in the course of the calculations, we will be comparing contributions from various different topologies, num uh, number of boundaries and, and different genus. Okay, so these are at least the players. Now, um, just to say to you, uh, you know, uh, if, if you've thought about gravity in higher dimensions a little bit, uh, basically the, the standard action uh, for four-dimensional gravity, uh, which was written by, uh, actually, I think people can correct me. Historically, it's really uh, David Hilbert who wrote, I think, the action down. Einstein had the equations. I'm not 100% sure about history. Anyway, it's called the Einstein-Hilbert uh, action or term. Involves just the Ricci scalar and you can add a constant if you like. And one way to think about the two dimensional theory we are talking about here is you could start from four dimensions and do some kind of a dimensional reduction. If you were to say only be interested in spherically symmetric situations in four dimensions, then you can come down from four dimensions to two dimensions. You'll be left with the two dimensional metric and an extra degree of freedom, which is the radius of the two sphere. And that is roughly the way you can think about this two-dimensional theory we have. We are left with the two-dimensional Ricci scalar, which is an imprint of the Einstein-Hilbert term. And the scalar here, dilaton, which I'm calling, is, if you like, uh, what's left over from the, the radius of the two-sphere and, uh, you know, some constants and so on. Okay, so it's a sort of a cartoon of the higher dimensional case. But it's much simpler. One physically very important difference is that this two-dimensional theory has no gravity waves. In four dimensions, 
as you know, there are genuine excitations of just space time, what are called gravity waves that were seen by the LIGO experiment, as you know, a couple of years ago, a very big discovery predicted by Einstein and so on. Uh, that gives you an idea of, of all the complications, the full set of uh, solutions of Einstein's equations, which are famously nonlinear, are of course not known. Uh, here, there are no gravity waves. The dynamics is so simple uh, that you can write down the complete set of uh, classical solutions to this problem. Okay, so that, that's, a, that's a big a big thing because it means you can really thoroughly understand the classical mechanics of the system. And it turns out that even though there are no gravity waves, this system has black holes in it. And I won't go into describing it. I just say this to you to say why it's an interesting model, simple enough that we can hope to make progress and yet having some of the mysteries of, of, of higher dimensions, okay? So, so this is why people are interested in it. Uh, as I said, the classical solutions are totally known. And the next problem would be to try and understand, oh, here, sorry, don't mind just because I was trying to cut across all communities. Uh, if you haven't seen what the Euler character is, or maybe you have, this is just a, a reminder uh, that it's a, a way to keep track of topology. It's two minus two times the genus minus the number of boundaries. And uh, the genus is roughly how many handles you have, okay? How many ways you can cut, uh, say, this surface without along closed curves without disconnecting it. So here the genus is two uh, for the disc, you can't make any such cut, so the genus is zero, et cetera. So um, anyway, um, it, it's some way to keep track of topology. Okay, now we know all the classical solutions in this problem. Uh, we want to go towards quantizing the theory, but uh, you know, uh, that's a challenge. Uh, and so we want to sort of simplify the problem. And what I'm going to do is what Ramdas alluded to, namely, um, I'm going to uh, I'm going to change signature uh, shortly. But before that, uh, let me say this much about even the case with uh, this mixed signature, which we call uh, Minkowski signature in physics language, uh, one space and one time. Uh, sorry. Um, in that case, you know, when you were to find the classical solutions, when you extremize over the uh, over this action by varying with respect to the field phi, um, what you get is that r plus two, as I was saying, is zero, and so that tells you you're working with manifolds of uh, constant uh, negative curvature. In this case of signature minus one one, uh, when we'll go to the problem of uh, standard signature. Euclidean signature, both positive. Again, this condition will survive because the action will basically still continue to be of this form. And that will then land us on uh, a sum over geometry, which are all hyperbolic spaces. Uh, much uh, 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 hi, Sandeep. Uh, can you just uh, say what's the analog of H bar here when you say classical and quantum? Yes. And I, I went over that also too quickly. H bar, that role is played by G here, uh, Kedar. A G is, if you like, the leftover of G Newton. If I formulated gravity in terms of an action, then Newton's uh, gravitational con constant sits in front of the action, the way I've normalized things. And when I then go to two dimensions and so on, again, there's a constant which sits in front of this action, which is, it turns out in two dimensions, dimensionless. And that serves, or, or okay, rather more correctly, has dimensions of H bar, if you like, the way I've defined things, and that will play the role of H bar for us. Is that okay? So classically, yeah. I when I am in the limit G going to zero, uh, then I'll be in the classical limit in this problem. But it doesn't divide all the terms; it only divides the bulk term. Uh, it divides both the bulk and the boundary term, if you. It's probably hard to see, but the square bracket uh, enclosed. Oh, okay, thank you. I, I couldn't see that. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. No, that might not. Yeah, it divides both. It's just an overall factor. Sandeep, uh, one quick question. When you Please. do the, with the Euclidean signature and you, you do the functional integral, yeah. would there be a e to the i times the action or e to the minus, minus the action? It, 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 yes, very good point. It will become e to the minus times the action. 
and maybe i can so so then it's not clear to me why the integral over phi forces a uh, delta function constraint on the curvature this is an extremely good point and it is because uh, that's not the last of the tricks or fast ones i'm going to pull on you okay, okay, uh, okay. but uh, what we will do uh, and this is following the work uh, that was done in the first order formalism is to try and make sense of the path integral when it comes to gravity we will not only have to make sense of the measure but we will also adopt a rather you know interesting let's say contour for uh, the scalar the dilaton which is we will rotate the signature to come to 2 comma 0 but we will rotate the dilaton to become pure imaginary ah okay okay, okay. and so, so we not, will do, uh, yeah that's right i'm coming to that so we will do that and this this is the kind of question which you know raises even question marks for physicists as to whether we are then doing something which is sensible and um, and uh, the last word has not been said except as i said uh, the final results will connect with interesting mathematics okay, okay. Uh, so but, but, know, but, yeah. mm -hmm. so yeah. does this connect with all the talk about contours that bitten has been doing uh, talking about the last few years ah uh, you because have... he has been talking about contours in field space quite a bit ah uh, now ramdas you'll have to tell me the context because uh, okay go ahead well, i'm sorry, not I, sure I, I, no, i'm holding you up yeah. go ahead yeah. no okay. yeah i'm not 100% sure it's the same uh, okay. but certainly this contour uh, has been much discussed and and uh, there are analogous issues in four dimensional gravity uh, because the action of four dimensional gravity uh, as you know ramdas is not positive definite even after you go to euclidean signature yeah yeah yeah, right? yeah, yeah. and this mm -hmm. is a very famous problem in euclidean quantum gravity and you have to try and make sense of it and uh, here we will make sense by also rotating the contour for the dilaton so that's thank you okay. yeah thanks yeah, yeah. Okay. thanks all right but let me just back up so we are going to do this continuation to signature 2 comma 0 and we'll do it in a the phys, the physicist way to do it is to now say that i'll take t to go to it which is just to say i'm doing analytic continuation but roughly if you were working with say the simpler space of this signature minus 1 1 which is what's called minkowski space with this kind of a line element and you did this you would go to this line element which is then of course of signature 2 comma 0 so this is roughly what physicists have in mind one of the reasons is if you did it uh, for point particle problems or or quantum field theories not involving gravity um, and i'll have a little more to say about those kinds of theories in a minute the path integral is often better defined path integral is still not totally well defined but better defined than in the minkowski case in you need all the help you can get in trying to make sense of it so you do this that's one of the reasons but there's another reason to do it which is it's well known that after you make that continuation in signature you still compute for a well known problem like point particle quantum mechanics or electromagnetism field theories something sensible from a physics point of view so what is it that you compute after you do a path integral where you have continued the signature in this way let's say it was our uh, point particle problem i was telling you about uh, now i have continued from t to it i am calling euclidean time with signature plus 1 now as tau uh, just to distinguish and let's say instead of going from ti to tf i'm going from tau equal 0 to say beta um let me also choose periodic boundary conditions for the point particle so it starts at some x lands up in x and i do the the integral from x to x over time euclidean time beta and i also sum over this position x okay all of that is contained in in this formula so i do the path integral from 0 to beta for some starting from some x landing up in x and i then also integrate over all values of x when i do that from a quantum mechanics point of view i compute something very interesting i compute what's called the partition function of the theory which is 
I compute um, trace of e to the minus beta h. I'll explain that beta here is the same parameter as beta, the length of the path in Euclidean time. H was the Hamiltonian, which I introduced. As I told you, there were two ways to formulate quantum mechanics, Lagrangian and Hamiltonian. Uh, this is the same Hamiltonian, which in quantum mechanics gets promoted to an operator. Uh, another operator. Uh, so, uh, so just to interpret what you're trying to say, are you integrating over loops in the space? So basically. Yes. Yes. yes, exactly, exactly. I'm integrating over loops. Uh, they start at x, end at x, and I'm also going to integrate over all the various possible values of the endpoints. And they have length beta. Thanks, thanks. Okay. I I'm scared to write anything on my tablet now, so <laughs> I'm just going ahead like that. But I can try to do that if you like. Um, Go ahead. Okay, and, and the Hamiltonian is an operator. It's a very important operator from the physics point of view because it's, um, it's expectation value or, or rather it measures the energy of the system. Okay, and uh, so it's a privileged kind of operator. And what, you, what this path integral, after you continue in signature and you, you do the integral over loops gives you is really the trace of the exponential of this operator with this factor of beta stuck into it. And as you can imagine, if you obtain this trace as a function of beta, you can obtain the entire spectrum of this operator, okay, h. And that means from a physics point of view, you can find out all the various possible energies of the system, the entire spectrum. What are the allowed eigenvalues of the system? So for the hydrogen atom, that would give you all the famous eigenvalues uh, of the hydrogen atom, which is something people uh, spent a lot of time trying to understand uh, in, in the uh, early part of the 20th century. So, so, um, so go ahead. So, so just one more thing. Yes. So you started off by defining the path integral as some kind of determinant. Somehow it has become this trace. So there is some log or exponential yes. going somewhere. So what that's exactly right. is happening? That's right. That's right. Uh, log of uh, a, a log of determinant ln det a is what trace ln is related to trace of the log, and then you have to do little more work. But uh, through those kinds of connections between determinants, so you can write the uh, the determinant as e to the log of the determinant, and ah and, okay thank you yeah the log of the determinant you can write as a trace, and I hope that at least sort of makes it reasonable that you will then end up getting traces of, of various things. In this case, it turns out to be trace of this operator, e to the minus beta h. Um, is that at least semi-plausible? I don't yeah, know. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Okay, okay, good. So, um, so now the only other thing is with all my delays, we are at 17.07. Um, so what I'm going to do, I don't want to take up too much time. Can I get, um, let's say 10 minutes? just to give you a flavor of sure. some of the results, sure. and then I'll try to end. I'm sorry, I've gone so slowly. Um, okay, so now we have continued in signature. And as I said, you know, if you try to find the classical solutions, they, they will give you these manifolds, uh, which are hyperbolic. These are well studied. Simplest example is the Poincare disk, as you all know. And the Poincare disk has this property that the total area diverges and most of the area lies towards the boundary of the disk where mod omega equals one, right? This is well known to you all. And that is the kind of surface we will be dealing with. And that means it's very important that we think about the boundary and the boundary conditions carefully in trying to make sense of our path integral. And um, one possibility and very natural is that you put bound the boundary to be a geodesic of some length as Ram Das was alluding to, but we won't take that kind of boundary. We'll take a, what seems like a rather strange boundary to begin with, but actually the motivations come from physics and uh, in particular from an extremely important conjecture uh, called the ADS-CFT conjecture uh, in string theory. The ADS here stands for anti dissiter space, which is um, physics language perhaps for spaces with a constant negative curvature of the kind we are dealing with here in hyperbolic space. Um, 
CFT stands for something conformal field theory, never mind. But the way that, uh, what that conjecture says is if you take the kind of boundary conditions we will now impose, then the results um, you get out of gravity should Sandeep, be related. Uh, yeah. so the thing is, uh, you, can, you can continue this lecture into a different lecture also, then you can happily finish everything that you want to say. So you can, whatever, I mean, so we can have another lecture in between also, because that, that, I mean, one people would like to hear you finish this stuff. So you don't need to hurry. You can sort of try to shorten, I mean, try to sort of say what, what you want today, and then we can carry on on another day. Also. Uh, okay. Whichever you, whichever, what, 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 what would you prefer? I, what I can do, uh, because I don't want to strain your patience in terms of time is, uh, I just wanted to state the problem at least somewhat precisely. After this slide, I'll simply jump to the results, uh, which will involve the volume of uh, various moduli spaces, uh, show you that result, uh, show you also, and just give you a sentence about how the same kind of result arises from random matrix theory, and then I'll end for today. What do you feel? So uh, basically, at the end of the day, you know what you can say is that there is a sort there is a sort of path integral formulation. It gives some results and it sort of connects to interesting mathematics. Uh, and and then if you like, I can come back. It all depends on. You. Yes. Okay. Okay. Great. Okay. Fine. Great. Okay. Right. What, what okay. So just to say, the kind of boundary conditions we'll put are that you know we will allow the boundary to go all the way to the boundary of the point carded disk the boundary of the space over which we are integrating. At that point, the area starts diverging. So we have to try and make sense of the path integral. And we will kind of uh, uh, take a careful limit where we will allow the boundary length to diverge in a particular way with this parameter epsilon, the dilaton to also blow up in a coordinated way. In this limit, um, with some further uh, comments I would have to make, you will ultimately be able to extract finite answers from the path integral, okay? And that's the motivation for these kind of boundary conditions. So, uh, and it's sort of well motivated from physics. So that's what is done. And and uh, what, what the ADS CFT conjecture says is the final result will be related to what I was mentioning a moment ago, a kind of partition function in, in uh, quantum mechanics, trace of e to the minus h, um, this is what the conjecture would, would in general lead us to expect. And that is what will happen, but there'll be a kind of twist uh, to the tail. And I'll tell you what the twist is. The twist is that it'll turn out in this case, when we finally come to the results, that it is the trace of such an Hamiltonian, but not in a single quantum mechanics system, but rather over a set of, of quantum mechanics systems, which where you are summing over uh, a class of Hamiltonian. So you take that trace e to the minus beta h and you average in some way over a class of Hamiltonians. That's the answer that gravity will give you. It will turn out. Um, and that it's through that random average that the connection with random matrix theory will arise. So it's a little bit like this, the system, uh, you know, it seems very complicated. It's a theory of gravity and so on and so forth. Ultimately, when you do it, it's a little bit like a hydrogen atom, you know, you get some spectrum and so on, except it doesn't correspond to one kind of atom uh, or one kind of system, but rather a, a system where you have to average over various types of Hamiltonians, okay? Uh, that's the twist in the tail, not something we have seen earlier in our study of gravity, uh, but which is what comes out of this particular path integral when you do it. Okay. So, so, so this one, one dimensional thing is, is this the boundary condition, the, the, the placeholder for the geodesic? It's closely related to the placeholder in that the boundary condition, as I said, is, is uh, something which involves not geodesics, but we will basically break up the path integral, as you'll see, into two parts. First, we'll do a path integral which terminates on a geodesic, and then we will have a sort of uh, a factor which will take us from the geodesic to this blowing up boundary. Um, uh -huh. And because of that, the final answer will be writable in terms of the moduli space of Riemann surfaces whose border yeah. is geodesics. 
so uh, so essentially the integral over the so so the, there's going to be this flaring annulus from the geodesic to infinity exactly and presumably what you are doing by this normalization of uh, i mean of, of allowing your dilaton to uh, also have a complementary thing is that the integral that there's, there's some term that you are integrating over the boundary which is remaining finite all the way to infinity that's right. That that's right. Oh. That's right. That's right. That's right. The purpose of this additional factor is that, that it will allow us to connect to this, um, ham, you know, trace of a Hamiltonian, you know, a, a kind of physics result. Uh, but that's right. That's right. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll just um, okay, so show so, you. Uh, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I shouldn't, shouldn't be interrupting, but uh, the other, I mean, one thing is that there there are sort of versions where you take this this kind of hyperbolic flaring annulus, mm -hmm. and if you look at the conformal analog, it's like a straight Euclidean cylinder going off to infinity. Um, is mm. is that some somehow related? No, maybe not. Uh, no. Okay, never mind. Yeah, not not directly, not directly, um, but. Um, in, in some cases, okay, let, let, let me say not directly. It's not okay. a conformal factor alone. Uh, okay. This okay. is sort of slightly a little more complicated, but, uh, but, but okay. But, but what you say, okay, here is the general case. I show you a general answer one gets. Um, here is uh, a, a genus two surface um, ending in these three flaring regions. But really, the path integral is done most efficiently by first thinking of this genus two surface ending. Uh, what I've drawn here in these, uh, what I tried to show here through these blues is actually three geodesics of length B3, B1, B2, and B3. And then these flaring trumpets, which take you from the geodesics out to uh, sort of infinity. Um, the, and the, the most general answer you get for the path integral when you do it for a general case of n boundaries and, and some genus can always be expressed like this. Uh, as a result of which the, the final answer for the path integral, and here um, I've written the, 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 on the left-hand side, the fact that you have these asymptotic boundaries with parameters beta one to beta n um, and some genus, some number of boundaries n can then be written in this way. Uh, these are the flaring up factors uh, and what appears interestingly then uh, is simply uh, for, for the path integral, uh, which involves the uh, Riemann surface of some genus ending on geodesics, uh, won't surprise you that the gravity path integral gives you simply the volume of the moduli space of all Riemann surfaces uh, of this genus with these n geodesic boundaries. Okay. Yeah. Um, vol volume with respect to what? I mean, what is good. the metric on the model? Good, good, good. So with respect to the Weil-Peterson metric, ah. the Weil-Peterson measure. A and the reason is, is the following. Um, this, uh, as I said, this is a very simple theory of gravity. So eventually um, what you can do is show uh, that the path integral reduces to a integral over moduli space of, of Riemann surfaces with say these geodesic boundaries. And it turns out very beautifully um, uh, that the measure, when you make sense of it, you know, this measure I struggled with even for quantum mechanics, when you make, when you try to make sense of it in the gravity theory, the measure becomes the Weil-Peterson measure in moduli space. Uh, this is something which was shown for the uh, general case of all genus by Saad Schenker Stanford uh, by connecting to Witten's work on Chern Simon's theory and so on. A very beautiful connection I can tell you about some other day. Uh, we also did it in a more pedestrian way for a low, low enough genus very explicitly, working explicitly with the metric. But I think we have a general structure of an argument which will connect for all genus also. But it's a very beautiful fact that the gravity path integral gives you the Weil-Peterson measure. And so since you get that measure, you get this volume with respect to that measure.
Is that okay, uh, Mahan? Yeah, thanks. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay, yeah. so that's the answer which you, you get out and it's a very beautiful answer. Um, these volumes, uh, you will all know better, were shown by Mirza Khani. They're very hard to compute, I'm told, explicitly, because not because the measure is not known, but because the fundamental domain over which you have to do the integrals is quite complicated. Even physicists know that in simple examples. But what Mirza Khani showed was uh, that they, these volumes satisfy a very nice, beautiful recursion relation that relate the higher genus volumes to lower genus ones. And therefore, those recursion relations re give rise to similar relations, say, for the partition function, uh, uh, even after you add these flaring up factors. Or if you like, you can strip off the flaring of factors and just work in terms of these volumes directly. In any case, you have these recursion relations here, which are also present. Now, it turns out, and then I'll stop, it turns out that people have studied random matrix theory um, and shown that you get the same kind of recursion relations as we are getting here, thanks to the work of Mirza Khani, in random matrix theory. So let me just explain that if I may for five minutes and then I'll stop. But the bottom line is you get the same recursion relations in random matrix theory. Now, as you know, uh, to obtain actual numbers out of any kind of recursion relation, you need some starting values. These starting values in the gravity case are obtained by the results for low genus, say genus zero, one boundary and two boundary cases are the starting values after which the recursion relation gives you the answer for arbitrary genus, arbitrary number of boundaries. Um, those values we can obtain very explicitly once we have tried to make sense of the measure by doing the path integral. In the random matrix theory, those starting values are something you have to put in by hand. Uh, one of those two starting values because the, the probability with which you sum over random matrices is something for you to specify. So what you do in random matrix theory is you fix the probability measure to agree with one case, say genus zero, one boundary, the disk partition function. That fixes the random matrix theory completely. After that, the second starting point in the recursion relation, which is uh, genus zero, two boundaries, comes out to agree bang on between random matrix theory and the gravity path integral. And then the fact that you have the same structure of recursion relations in random matrix theory, which people had shown earlier, the same structure as Mirza Khani's means that the random matrix theory result agrees for the general case with the gravity path integral. So that's the structure of the argument. It's really very beautiful. Um, and I'll just tell you a little more. In general, it's a well-known fact um, that random matrix theory uh, gives rise to a sum over random surfaces. Uh, for example, if you take a random matrix theory like this, where you are summing over all Hermitian matrices with some measure, you can think of this measure, this exponential factor as giving you uh, uh, up to a normalization, a probability with which to draw a matrix in this random ensemble. Uh, that measure can have some parameter G. You can try to evaluate this partition function as a, by doing some kind of expansion in G, you find that every term in that expansion has a, a interpretation as a particular surface of some genus with some number of vertices, et cetera. So this is well known. Uh, and as I said, what was also known by, math, by uh, people was that uh, for suitable kind of random matrices, you get recursion relations, which are in fact identical to the form um, after you do some manipulations, some transforms to the recursion relations of Mirza Khani. Um, and then, as I said, the starting values can be adjusted and agree with the gravity case to give one-on-one -on -one agreement with the gravity calculation. So what is it that we learn from here? The random matrix theory is computing, as I said, averages over Hermitian matrices where you're drawing these matrices from some kind of ensemble. You can think of this Hermitian matrix as an operator, as the analog of that Hamiltonian uh, H. I purposely call them the same symbol H. In one case, it was an operator in some quantum mechanics. In the other case, it's a Hermitian matrix. Never mind. 
maybe the two can be identified. If we identify the two, then we are getting exactly the same result from the random matrix average as the gravity theory is giving us. So that means what we are learning is that gravity is equivalent to a theory where you have this um, Hamiltonian or this operator H, but it's being drawn from a random average from some, sorry, it's being drawn from a random ensemble. Uh, so that is the bottom line which comes out. I'll just now conclude. The bottom line is that JT gravity can be quantized. I haven't shown you all the slate of hand we, we've done, people have done, but, um, but um, we do try to make sense of the measure. We use a peculiar kind of contour, but at the end, you do quantize it. And the result you get is that it's related to these random Hamiltonians. Now, this is where we stand today. Uh, there's much more to do. Um, the fact that you have contributions from different uh, disconnected boundaries, say two, two disconnected boundaries, but then connected by um, a, a surface going between them. These are called in physics language wormholes. Uh, lots of speculation. What are the lessons for higher dimensional gravity? Is gravity sometimes uh, equivalent to these kind of random averages? Uh, we have thought not so far. Uh, what role do wormholes play? Uh, and so on. Uh, lots of discussion going on. And I'm sure uh, we'll hear much more about it in the days to come. So sorry to go over time. Uh, but let me stop here and take some questions and maybe one-on-one, -on -one, if any of you are interested, I can share more details. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Hi, Sandeep. Thanks. Uh, yeah. I, yeah. I have a question, if I may. Yeah, please, please. Uh, okay, so sorry for my, for my lack of knowledge in the random matrix theory, but you mentioned that you, uh, in order to, uh, I mean, calculate things, you have to uh, choose a you know, starting point, which you chose to be, Genus zero boundary one uh, geo geometry. I mean, like that's right. The, the that's, right. that's right. But uh, but if we if we choose like like genus zero but two boundary to begin with, uh, yeah. will the information about the genus zero boundary one uh, topology lost uh, in the process? No, rather it would be fixed. You know what happens is basically um, the probability p of h has to be fixed um, okay. and and uh, the at least the I'll have to think a little bit but I, at least the way it works for the if you fix it in the genus zero case is that this fixes p of h completely just the disk answer because you need to reproduce an entire function of beta correctly mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. so that fixes your p of h I think that will be the case if you rather try to fix it with the genus one case two, I'm not genus one, the, the genus zero two boundary case two. Um, so, but in any case, uh, I'm 100% I'm confident of the disk case, this fixes P of H completely. And then you have no freedom left in the random matrix theory, you know, because the, the sum is totally determined. The nice thing is that, sorry, where did that go? That the, um, that the uh, answer for the two boundary case works out right on the nose as shown by Saad Shankar Stanford. And after that, the general structure of recursion relations proves the equality. Yeah, so okay. that is the, 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 the argument. Uh, okay, and another uh, point that uh, when you were, uh, um, I mean, taking the boundary to be parameterized by this uh, epsilon, like you are introducing this yes. cut off, yes. you are not actually, uh, as far as I know, you are not actually considering the entire ADH2, but uh, what is called the nearly ADH2, if I am right, yes. right? Is, yes. Is this yes. true? Yes. And, this is correct. Okay. This is correct. Yeah. I'll, I'll just explain that in a minute. That's correct. You know, this dilaton, uh, hello? Yeah. Uh, this dilaton, actually, uh, if you were to, I didn't write down the classical solutions, but the classical solutions, uh, which are sort of best behaved are those where this dilaton blows up towards the boundary also. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the, the behavior of the dilaton actually uh, spoils the isometries, the SL2R isometries of, of yeah. ADS2. And you have to cut off that blow up somewhere. And, and that's why you have sort of nearly, uh, first of all, the isometries are broken. So in that sense, you have sort of nearly SL2R, but not exactly. And then you are also cutting it off. But that's right. Okay. 
and the last one uh, sorry uh, the last one i mean uh, i sorry i was not present from the beginning of the talk but uh, in the jt gravity uh, model that you didn't mention what s0 physically is if ah. i am correct is it the like the zero temperature entropy the intrinsic entropy of the black hole you were mentioning about that's right that's right that's right okay. it's actually an extremely uh, important parameter uh, just uh, to say that um, uh, to everyone that um, you know um, i i mentioned to you that you can think of this two dimensional theory as a caricature of a four dimensional theory where you uh, you know, taken spherically symmetric configurations. Um, and it turns out that uh, really what you're doing here is, is uh, considering um, a sort of uh, re reductions uh, on what are to begin with four dimensional black holes. Uh, and this S naught is the uh, entropy of that uh, zero temperature black hole. Um, mm -hmm. are in them. So that's, yeah. that's exactly correct. But just to say to him that, to people that this parameter is extremely important because uh, one of the major successes of string theory was to be able to account in some microscopic way for, for exactly how this parameter arises from, from the underlying physics, which gives you the microstates of those black holes. So I, that won't make much sense, but just to say, yes, Arindam, that's related to that. And it's a rather important parameter uh, from the view of uh, understanding in-depth four-dimensional gravity. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, no more question. Uh, Thanks a lot. Is there any other question? Why? Uh, okay. Yeah. Can sorry, I, I had a question. Can I ask you? Yeah. So, is there any okay, the, yeah. uh, the random Hamiltonian you're talking about in that in your particular context? Why is it natural to average over partition function with disorder rather than free energy? I mean, I notice you're doing average of the trace rather than average of the log trace. Log trace. Ah. Um, right. Um, uh, that's right. I, I don't have a, a good answer other than to say to you, certainly from the gravity point of view, you get an average over the partition functions. You know, um, what happens is very interestingly, on the gravity side, if you look at one of these wormhole configurations, sorry, let me just go there. Um, you know, you have a geometry like this with two boundaries, each of which is supposed to be dual in ADS CFT or whatever equivalent to a theory with a Hamiltonian living on its boundary. And the natural thing here then is just the average of, or if you like, the two point function of the partition functions, Kedar, for two different temperatures. I see. Um, now, so that is what is, it is in the case of, of the uh, gravity case. Now, um, somehow, and I am not, I must say, not so well versed with the random matrix literature, but there are then these random ensembles which compute similar things. Uh, rather than taking the log and averaging, as you say, you average the Zs themselves. Um, but, but so somehow the connection to random quantum mechanics is a bit subtle then. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree with you. Uh, I was also a bit puzzled, but um, it, you can construct such a connection, let's say. Um, yes. Yeah. yeah. So the random matrix does not have anything directly to do with these boundary uh, quantum theories. Well, you know, that's a good question. We, we, it is not as if we have been able to understand in great detail the random Hamil the, the Hamiltonian to begin with of these boundary theories and uh, so so in fact can you say, so you mean you cannot write it down you said that it's some one dimensional theory so I thought you would exhibit yeah. at least yeah. one of these random Hamiltonians yeah. Can, yeah. Are you able to do no no very far from it uh, can as far as I know uh, we cannot write it down in any kind of natural way at all. Uh, you know, through, through some kind of quantum system with a phase space and so on that we have quantized as far as I know. So it's a very Perfect. implicit understanding just coming out of this random. No, wait, wait. So, you know, th this comes out of that those factors Z, right? The, the, res uh, the result comes out, but, oh, but just, uh, so we, you have to take some limit of that Z. I mean, is that the point? Because you have that that is that Z referred to a kind of annulus and then 
we, whereas yeah. your, uh, I mean, is the, I mean, why are you not able to exhibit one of these Hamiltonians? Well, you know, in general, the ADS CFT uh, statement is very hard to make precise. As in, you know, you have gravity in ADS space, and uh, you know, um, uh, Ramdas, as you know very well. In uh, gravity, the uh, the Hamiltonian is actually a boundary charge. You know, it's like a gauge theory, where the uh, due to Gauss law and so on, the charge is actually defined at infinity. You know, and yeah. and, and so on general grounds, we know that the gravity theory will possess a Hamiltonian that is defined on the boundary. But from there to go to a precise kind of statement as to what is the uh, quantum mechanics or the quantum theory which possesses this Hamiltonian. That's a very non-trivial step. And uh, we have been able to carry it out in string theory as far as I know, only in cases where we had the underlying description in terms of all the complications of string theory. You know, um, and, and here where we are given the gravity theory as far as I know, no one has quite been able to construct the detailed phase space and quantized. You don't even have an answer for it, no? Uh, I at least don't have it. I don't know whether, um, you know, people have tried, maybe Spenta can say more if he's here in terms of phase space of various, uh, you know, co-adjoint orbits and so on. I don't know, Spenta, would you say, as far as I know, it's not a very explicit construction. And okay, thank you. That's fine. Yeah, yeah, it's not very explicit. That's fine. Uh, Sandeep, a uh, couple of things. Uh, so one is um, this: this so if if you chop off these what you are calling trumpets, so these yeah. flaring annuli, so there should be essentially the these hyperbolic surfaces with totally geodesic one totally geodesic boundary of length l, and then there is some integral that you are computing as you are letting the radius go up to infinity. And right, 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 right? right and right, so these right. limits, if I have understood you correctly, is depend depends precisely on this one single parameter of the length of the boundary geodesic. Is that correct? Th th that's right. That's right. That's right. There is another actually parameter which was how the dilaton went. So more, but I'm keeping J fixed. Actually, you can just choose epsilon and to you know rescale epsilon to epsilon J. So if you like, it's a fake parameter but physicists sometimes like to include it. Uh, so there's really one parameter. I could have taken units of phi went like one over epsilon, length goes like beta over epsilon. So then all the asymptotic data is specified by this one number. That's okay, great. That's okay, uh, one other, yeah. So the other thing is at the end, you said something, you said this stuff about random matrix theory, yeah. but uh, here the, so Mirza Khani's uh, uh, recursive relations are with respect to genus. So yes. how does that genus come in on the uh, on the random matrix side? Yeah. Is it sort of higher order Feynman integral expansions? I mean, loops in the middle or what, what exactly is that? No, that's, that's, um, uh, that's a great question. I'm sorry, I had to rush over things. So I'll tell you how that happens. You know, so you take a random matrix, say in terms of uh, ra uh, N by N, say Hermitian matrices, as I've done here, and you then have this rank of the matrix N, you know? And what yeah. happens is if you, if you uh, choose uh, to define things properly, then say the perturbative expansion in G, uh, which also gives- What is G? I mean, uh, apart from the, the fact that the letter is G, I don't see the connection. Oh, it's just G. some, I'm just trying to generate an expansion in the cubic term, yes. just to okay. be able to yes. show a connection with surfaces. Um, so let's say I try to do this integral over n by n matrices uh, by uh, taking this exponential and just expanding the e to the g trace h cube as one plus g trace h cube plus g trace h cube square, etc. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, then um, I will be able to do the expansion uh, in powers of g, this, cu this yeah. coupling constant. Yes, and what yes. you'll find is that uh, each such term has a has a interpretation as a surface. For example, here I have one, two, three, three powers of, uh, of G, at least in the inside, 
Okay, but interestingly, there will be some net power of n, the rank of the matrix. Yeah. That net power of n will correspond to the Euler character of the surface you are generating. You can show ah. that just by counting how the powers of n appear. So, for example, if you if you generate a surface like this, which is a disk, then yeah. you know you'll get uh, chi of two. I'm oh, sorry, one. Okay. <laughs> The one yeah. boundary, no genus, so chi of one. So you'll get a net power of one. And if you generate a surface of arbitrary genus G and N boundaries, the power of N will be uh, the, the correct power of N. So mm. what you do is you take your random matrix theory and you compute these traces um, yeah. uh, of, of these quantity, and then you expand it in, a, in powers yeah. of N. Every term gives you the corresponding genus G contribution. Say if you have fixed yeah. the number of boundaries, you know, um, uh, and that is, it is that contribution uh, for a genus G, which you can relate to lower genus through a recursion relation, which maps one on one. Oh, I see, oh, I see. Yeah, so that's how the map works. This yeah. is something very beautiful that I didn't know about and still don't understand very well. I think others, even here, like Spenta certainly understand much better, uh, which was done by Einard and Orantin and so on um, earlier. Uh, but uh, in this context, you know, we can relate it very directly to just the gravity uh, story as well. Yeah, no, so, so there is one thing very tempting here yeah. from a mathematical point of view, which is, I mean, if you do some reverse engineering here, see, you, 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 you match the two sides by basically setting the zero term, I mean, for a, for a disk, then you match the measure there, and then you, uh, that led to the matching of all the terms, and then you basically uh, deduce something from, for, for the right-hand side, I mean, for the, the, yes. the matrix integral expansion from Mirza Khani's recursive relation. Yes. What if you change your measure at the initial stage? That yeah. should give you different recursive relations uh, on the on the geometry side, namely on the, basically it will be some, some naturally defined thing that you're integrating over surfaces and you're going to cut along um, some curve to get some other recursive relation. Yeah, this, you know, this is a great question. And now I will try to give you a tentative answer, but it will lack the certainty that uh, I should have because I've not studied this well enough. But I'll tell you what I gather from what is said and others yeah. can correct me. You know, if you take a particular class of these random matrix theories, which are in what is called the double scaling limit, that is some way of taking the large N limit. Then what I'm told is in general, you get recursion relations, which are, if not identical to Mirza Khani, very similar. Now this is where my lack of precision is showing. Um, in some cases, perhaps even the same, but the starting values, if you adjust it in different ways will be different. So yeah. let me ask you this. It's true also in Mirza Khani's recursion relations that if you literally wanted to get the volumes of the uh, border yeah. Riemann surfaces, um, you know, correct, you have to start with some particular starting values. Is that is Yeah, that... so th that's true, but that we, we call, I mean, that's basically some kind of a renormalization, I mean, that kind of a normalization thing, where you take essentially the, the I mean, as you, you were saying, this the, the Bale peterson volume form. So ah. that you can, that, that's well defined up to a scale. Ah. So that, ah. I mean, you just choose the scale to fit some topological quantity and then everything is determined everything there. Is, I see, I see, I see. Okay, okay. So, uh, you know, uh, what, what I, I'm sorry, I, I, this is a great question. I should study more and come back to you. What I know is that you get in a class of these model matrix models, uh, recursion relations, which are very similar um, to the Mirza Khani one. Uh, I, I think now how much freedom we have, I'll have to study. In, in, there is certainly a class where you get exactly the same but with uh, starting values, you can vary depending on what starting uh, uh, probability measure you choose. Uh, but uh, yeah. how much total freedom there is, I, I, I won't be able to answer to you. Yeah, sorry. But I think uh, there is some, there's some set of matrix theories which might give you uh, a class of recursions. Uh, yeah.
Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. It's thanks. a very interesting question. I'll have to come back to you with more definitive answer. Thank you, uh, Sandeep. Uh, yeah, please can I say something. Yes. Yes. Please, you know more. Is it? Uh, no, no, yeah. Not at all. I mean, uh, this. Uh, <clears throat> Mr. Khani's uh, calculations have to do with uh, smooth Riemann surfaces, right? Uh, geometric yes. objects. Yes. So this is why I think you need to do the double scaling limit. Ah. Uh, because you need to work with smooth Riemann surfaces. I see, I see. And, uh, and these recursion relations in the matrix models are just the Schwinger Dyson equations mm -hmm. of the, of the mm -hmm. conservative type of matrix models. Ah, uh, I see. And, uh, I see. Yeah, so and, and they simply follow from the invariance of the measure and the, the unitary group transformations. So it's a very simple, very simple in matrix theory to do this. I see, I see. Yes. Uh, and then yeah. and then, do you get, uh, do you always land up with the Mirza Khani recursion spenta in the double scaling yeah. or? I think so. I, think I see so. you always land up in. I, I in think so, but I have not derived those myself. I understand the matrix theory side much better. Yeah. Yeah, no, yeah. it would be nice for me to be able to discuss this with you because, yeah, I, I understand it much less uh, well yeah. compared to you. But yeah, so, uh, okay, may, maybe then uh, Spenta, as Spenta is saying, maybe in fact for the double scaling limit, Mahan, uh, yeah. you, you always get the recursions of Mirza. I, I, I think, think so. Yeah, yeah. I and then so. the only freedom in this limit is what the initial probability is, you know, yes. with which you draw. Uh -huh. You need a boundary condition to solve the equations. That, that's what it is. I see. Yeah. No, the thing is, I mean, uh, see, what, what is sort of really striking about this is on, on one side, you're getting random surfaces, yeah. which are nowhere near smooth. On the other side, you're also getting surfaces, but they are smooth Riemann surfaces. Yes, so that's where the, the double geometry. scaling limit is important. Yeah, yeah. so yeah, yeah. The, that's the, right. The double scaling limit uh, is very important in order to ensure the fact that you are looking at the continuum limit of the Riemann surface rather than a lattice formulation. You know? Yeah. In, in, in our, the triangulations you can do on a Riemann surface, those triangles must all go to zero in, yeah. in area, right? Yeah. I was yeah. So, so that, that's yeah. what... So, yeah, you take yeah. So it, in, yeah. Go ahead, that's no, right. No, in, in, in the... So, so for example, in the Liouville uh, quantum gravity formulation, you take essentially something like a discrete Gaussian free field, where the Hausdorff measure is different from two. So you can put in a measure which is not sort of not the Euclidean two-dimensional thing, but though the topology is two-dimensional, the measure is actually four-dimensional. And uh, so, 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 so basically just as a sort of a, a Brownian one-dimensional version is that a, a smooth curve is one-dimensional, whereas a Brownian motion path is, is, is two-dimensional Hausdorff measure. I see. So, yeah, so that's, I mean, so if you have different measure classes, this would be really sort of mind blowing. I mean, it's, uh, it'll be sort of the next step. I mean, you, you guys could predict some conjectures for us to sort of <laughs> attack for the next whatever, how many decades. So, so can I ask uh, Mahan, can you formulate yeah, what you said a little bit more precisely? Yeah. What did you yeah, say? Yeah, I'll have to, th Just I'll say have to again. think about this. Think about this much more. So basically, the thing is, uh, so if when one looks at, uh, say, random surfaces, yeah. uh, one model would be basically, say, take the sphere, mm -hmm. and then you look at a random triangulation of that, which means you, you divide it into some, uh, you look at all triangulations, and you put the uniform measure on the space of triangulations on the, on the sphere. Right. Now, yeah, and, and you make sure that each triangle is, say, an equilateral triangle. Okay. You could do the same thing for quadrangulations. You could use squares. And mm -hmm. then you normalize to, I mean, there are different kinds of normalization. One would be to assume that, each, that the total diameter of the sphere is something fixed or the total area of the sphere is something fixed. Mm -hmm. And then you let the number of uh, triangles or the number of uh, squares go to infinity. Yeah. The, the limiting gadget would be a random sphere. Mm -hmm. The topology does not change along the way. The thing is, in, in any reasonable way of taking this limit, the, so the, I mean, topologically, it's remaining a two-dimensional sphere all along the way. But the, the limiting gadget is becoming extremely uh, crinkled. I mean, it's, uh, the, the, if, you, if you want to compute the 
house of dimension i mean this so look at look at how the measure scales with respect to the euclidean thing it will behave as if it's morally four dimensional volume scaling i mean the, the way the, uh, the the volume of r4 scales rather than the way the volume of r2 scales i see that's 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 going to be sort of the random surface model on one side so essentially you could look at i mean if you want to put it in by hand you just look at da which is the area form and you put it put it to the power some lambda where lambda is some number between 1 and I mean, possibly strictly greater than 1 mm. that would give you a, a, i mean yeah so that would give you a way of measuring volume but yeah it will it will be it will have uh, area dimension or house of dimension strictly greater than 2 yeah in the process yeah um, i understand so the basically what you're saying is that the conformal mode of the riemann surface side that ought to give you some bunch of measures which are now singular with respect to the weil peterson measure but they still have a well defined uh, dimension in terms of these area scalings so essentially there should be i mean well if this if all this pipe dream goes through then there should be a sort of a continuums worth of mirza khani recursive relations that's that's sort of i see what one is trying to get at i mean if one can do it on the right hand side in the matrix model side by starting with measures on the disk which are not not the usual dx square plus dy square plus dx but instead it's dx square plus dy square whole to the 1 plus epsilon mm -hmm. then one should be able to transfer that that measure to back to the geometry side and get maybe new matrix or yeah maybe yeah fractal matrix on the modelized space and volumes with respect to them that's 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 what i was trying to get at it's it's nowhere near as precise as i would like it but yeah that's that's vaguely the idea that i had yeah so spenta doesn't it uh, am i wrong but it seems like oh. what you would uh, what we would do in terms of a cosmological constant no studying the behavior with respect to that spenta Yeah, I no, I no, no, I'm there. Ah, uh -huh. I didn't quite understand what he's saying because I mean, I mean, if you think about uh, a conformal metric on two-dimensional space, then you can mm -hmm. imagine a complicated uh, interaction that can give rise to a you know scaling dimension of the conformal mode, which is not uh, you know standard, but you have uh, anomalous pieces actually, which might say that. But how do you get the higher dimensions is this i didn't understand that oh, oh no 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 Hi higher dimensions is not coming from uh, i mean it's it's not topological dimensions it's still r2 but mm. the way you are measuring the met i mean say basically yeah. you say even if it's in one dimension if yeah. instead of looking at dx you say you suppose you look at dx to the 3 by 2 mm. that's the way you measure lens see yeah. what, what let me just uh, say i don't know if this will help but i think he's saying uh if you had a smooth geometry then the area would go like the uh you know length square you know yes. but right, if right, it's right. highly crinkled it could go as some higher power yes. as if so that's what i thought the if you i understand that if mm. you if you write the two dimensional metric locally yeah. as a conformal factor times <coughs> r2 r metric right yes Now the conformal factor can have anomalous dimensions, right? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, yes, that, uh, yes. That's what yes. I was trying to. That's what that's you right, were saying. That's also. right. That's right. That's right. But but Spenta, this would amount to adding a cosmological constant term. No, I mean, Mahan yeah, Mahan yeah, yeah, was yeah, adding yeah. area to powers, but you could write it as right as, as you know as the exponential. Right, right. Yes. Uh, I I don't know. You'll know the random matrix and Mahan. What I can say is your question is certainly totally well posed in terms of the gravity path integral I was describing. I see. And it's a very interesting question, which is very very non-trivial to do. You know. Uh, okay. At least that much I can say. But Spenta should say the. Uh, you, you'll know the. No, I I don't have any better answer. But I like to ask you a. a different question if you and don't mind sandeep this is no, no please talk, but... please but spend it just give no no please do but let me just show uh, show if yeah. you give me a minute the term in the action which you, one would have to add so um you know here uh, mahan 
the way you are uh, instead of weighting it with the area hello yeah yeah go ahead uh, you know you could write it up in the x this action goes the, the oh yeah 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 that's correct that's correct so i mean basically what you are saying is essentially say something like e power gaussian free field as your area form or or yeah e e power minus some constant times area form yes 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 okay. yes yes that then, that will definitely yes that's 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 uh, right that will do yes. what you are saying that makes the problem much more complicated by the way it, it, it's a great question to ask i i have thought about it a bit i couldn't make progress but i, I think that's the sort of thing that would be very interesting to do from mm. the gravity end also uh, okay uh, anyway yeah. spenta please, please go ahead. i mean let me ask you the question don't change the slide Oh, okay. Now you have a you oh, have oh. an action, right? Yes. Yes. <laughs> you have an action, as you explained in your first slides. Uh, if you are given a Lagrangian, you can write down a Hamiltonian, right? Yes. So you can write down a Hamiltonian formulation of this action with yeah. constraints. What does that Hamiltonian have to do with all the other Hamiltonians <laughs> we were talking about? I started <laughs> the questions, friends. <laughs> I'm, I don't really? understand it well enough. I don't know you. you um, it. I, I, well, I haven't studied the Hamiltonian formulation as clearly, I'll be honest, but you might have. I, I don't know the answer. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, no, I don't know the answer, actually. This is a very important question that uh, if you take a, you know, a standard Hamiltonian formulation of this action, yeah. where do I see all this type of uh, uh, interesting uh, boundaries and geometries and how do I, how do I formulate this problem? I, I, I don't know the answer to this question. I mean, right, right. Um, yeah, yeah. So, um, okay. I mean, I, I'd be happy to talk to you a little more yeah. about this <laughs> off, off, offline, maybe. But uh, yeah, yeah. I yeah, think it's yeah. a very good question, uh, and I, I, it's something I'd like to do. I haven't been able to do it well enough to say anything at this point. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Okay, thank, thank you very much, Sandeep. Thank Mr. you Mahana, very much.